Hey, look at that! I said I'd be back, and for once I actually kept my word about that. Yes, earlier today we had another episode of Comic Class go up in which I took a look at the first half of all the titles that were released for Marvel Fresh Start. So we talked about Black Panther, Venom, Deadpool, Doctor Strange, Immortal Hulk, and Thor. And now it's time for the second half of our look at the Marvel Fresh Start titles. So we're going to talk about Sentry, Tony Stark, Iron Man, Amazing Spider-Man, Life of Captain Marvel, X-23, and Captain America. Now, in case you missed that first episode that we did, a card for it should be popping up right now. Go ahead and click on that, because I didn't just talk about those first six tiles. I also talked about my feelings towards Marvel Fresh Start in general, about how I feel it was way more focused than any of the previous relaunches. I felt it was way smarter for them to not just relaunch all the books, but just about 12 of them. That's way easier to keep track of. It doesn't mess with any of the other books that people were following and enjoying and didn't need a relaunch. So, yeah, I feel like Marvel Fresh Start has kind of been a much smarter relaunch than any of the ones that they've done before. And I addressed all of that in the previous episode. So again, as I said, just go ahead and click on that card. Come back to us when you're ready, because now it is time to go into the Sentry. Now, the Sentry was this very interesting character. He was created for a miniseries where they came in and said that the Sentry had always been part of the Marvel Universe, and he had a huge impact on all these other characters' lives, but no one remembers him for some reason. And then eventually it's revealed that no one remembers him because he made them all forget him. Because even though he is the strongest hero in the Marvel Universe, he has a dark evil half that comes out whenever he does something good that then creates the same amount of evil that he created of good. So, in other words, he had to make everyone forget about him and go into retirement, otherwise he would just end up constantly hurting people whenever he tried to help them. So, yeah, they've done some very interesting stuff with him in the past, including killing him off and then bringing him back to life because he's just that powerful that no one can kill him, and they did some really fascinating stuff with him recently in the Doctor Strange books, but he's one of those characters that either you're going to knock it out of the park, or you're just kind of going to whiff on it, uh, not to come in here and badmouth anyone, but Brian Michael Bendis tried to do some really interesting stuff with him, and I don't really think he knew what he was doing with that character. However, other people have come in here, like Donnie Cates, or I'll even say the creator of this character, Paul Jenkins, did some really fascinating stuff with him. This book is now in the hands of Jeff Lemire, and I was very excited about that, but also a little bit hesitant, because Jeff Lemire, he's doing something right now over at Dark Horse with his title Black Hammer that's actually kind of similar to this. It's about a bunch of heroes living in a world where there were no heroes and they're all having to live in secret without anyone knowing that they were heroes. Like, okay, that's kind of century like Alright, I definitely see where you can like tie those two things together. But also, the last thing that he did at Marvel was Moon Knight, which was about a character who suffered from mental illnesses and it was all this big thing of, okay, what is real? Is he actually going on this big spiritual journey right now or is it all in his head? Is he actually fighting off God or is he actually crazy? And that's the kind of stuff that came up a lot in the Century book. A lot of it was, okay, were you actually a hero or was that all in your head? Is it you doing this or is it your dark half, the Void, who is actually doing all this stuff? They delved into lots of mental issues in the Sentry runs. So I looked at that, and I looked at his Moon Knight run, and I just went, oh man, yeah, that is the perfect guy for that. However, he also did a lot of other stuff at Marvel that I wasn't that keen on. Like, his X-Men run wasn't all that great, and his Hawkeye run, it was fine. It wasn't bad, it was just fine. So I was looking at this like, okay, it feels like he should knock this out of the park. But I still have that hesitation in the back of my mind. And I am happy to say, he kind of knocked it out of the park. In this new Sentry book, he's still retired. He's working as a fry cook at this diner alongside his former sidekick. And his former sidekick is one of the only people who still has memories of who the Sentry was. But the Sentry now has this device that sends him into this little tiny pocket universe that is basically the creation of his own mind. And when he goes in there, he can release all of his powers. He can go out there on these big, wondrous adventures, do whatever he wants because it's not real, it's all just inside his own head. And then when he does all these big, wondrous things in that world, the Void comes out, wrecks some stuff, but only in that world. Basically, it's a tiny bottle universe where he can keep the Void and keep the Sentry, and then in the real world, he just goes out there as this fry cook. So it's his way of making sure that he gets to release the Sentry. As long as he does that once every 24 hours, he can keep the Sentry's powers tapped down, and the Void will never come out. However, he's told this story to his former sidekick. 
His former sidekick is like, yeah, that's great. You get to go out there and do all these wondrous things once a day. Uh, I don't. I don't get to do any of that fun stuff. And at the end of the first issue, the device that allows him to go into this pocket universe once a day, someone else has taken it and someone is using it. I think it's obvious who ended up stealing it, but I'm wondering if that's a red herring. Like, I really feel like, yeah, it's gonna be revealed to be the sidekick in there, but it seems so obvious that I'm just like, all right, I think that you might have tried to lead us to that. I think you tried to make us think that was gonna be the sidekick, but who could it actually end up being? I'm very interested in seeing where this series ends up going, and yeah, I gotta say, I do think it's being a little overhyped because if you go on Comic Book Roundup, I think it has like over a 9 on there, and that's almost impossible for any book to get that high. Um, you know, I'd tap it down a little bit. Not that there's anything bad in it, there's just nothing in there that really just blew my mind. But it does feel like a really good setup. It feels like the setup for something that could end up blowing my mind down the road. This is the kind of stuff that I love from Jeff Lemire. As I said, it really did remind me of Black Hammer. That's why I was wanting out of this book. And it feels like, yeah, he kind of found a way to bring Black Hammer into the Marvel Universe. And he's doing it with the exact right character to do that with. So, yeah, I'm really excited to see where this series goes. Especially considering that this is not a miniseries. This is an ongoing series. I'm stunned at that i don't know where exactly this could end up going it might be one of those things where it's like yeah it's an ongoing but what they mean by that is yeah the writer has an endpoint in mind we don't know when that is but when he reaches that endpoint we're going to end the book so yeah if jeff lemire has like a 12-part storyline planned out for this then hey i am all on board for that he proved with moon knight that he can take a storyline that I look at and go, yeah, that's gonna be like five issues, and then stretch it out for like a year and a half, and have me fully on board the entire time. So, yes, even though there was nothing in this first issue that really wowed me, there was a lot there that got me invested. There was a lot there that made me go, okay, I can't wait to stick with this book for when it eventually does wow me. Next up is Tony Stark Iron Man, and this is such an interesting issue. Because it's the very first issue of Iron Man written by Dan Slott. And Dan Slott, for the past 10 years, has been on Spider-Man. And I have my feelings about his run, and not to spoil anything for you guys, but I'm currently working to set up a collaboration with someone else on YouTube where we just talk about our feelings towards the Dan Slott run. And yeah, it's kind of complicated feelings, but I bring that up for a reason, and you'll see why in just a second. This entire storyline, it's this guy who 25 years ago was trying to make robots to play robot soccer with each other. And if you guys have ever seen robot soccer, you know it's just like little tiny robots just ee, 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 kick a ball just very slowly, fall down, they get back up again. And he has a whole team working on this, and one of his robots falls over, and then it gets back up in three seconds, and he's like, that's a new record for how quick they can get up! And they go up against Tony Stark as this kid, and Tony Stark has like actual robots playing real soccer, like doing Pele kicks. And he just gets dominated by Tony Stark. And now you cut to 25 years later, and this guy, he's now still working on tiny robots. But he has actually figured out a way to make tiny robots that each have their own individual AI program that work together with each other without having a master program telling them what to do. Basically, they're robots that think independently, but still want to work together with each other rather than being told to work together with each other by a separate program. And Tony Stark thinks that's awesome. So Tony Stark buys up his company and then just shows up at his front door and goes, Hey, I just bought up your company. You now work for me. Come on with me. We're going to take you to your new lab over at Stark Unlimited. And he just almost kind of kidnaps this guy and takes him to Stark Unlimited, Stark's new company. And he's just taking him on the big tour. And this guy is just amazed by everything. The entire rest of this issue is just this guy seeing a day in the life of Tony Stark and just being blown away by it. Like, Fing Fang Foom attacks at one point, and Tony Stark brings out a giant Voltron robot to fight him, then he brings out tiny little microscopic robots to go and fight him, he brings out his regular Iron Man suit to fight him, and there's like a talking cat in the office, Jocasta is his boss, which, yeah, I gotta say, I freaking love Jocasta. Jocasta was one of the Avengers when I first started reading the Avengers, so whenever she pops back up, I'm like, oh, cool! Hey, that character that I liked when I was a kid, she's back. Listen, I come in here all the time and talk about how I want new stuff, but I fully understand the appeal of nostalgia, everybody. I get it. So yeah, Jocasta pops up in here, and he's like, 
oh wow, I'm working for Tony Stark. Jakaz is like, no, you work for me, I work for Tony Stark. And she's like the head of the um, robot ethics department there. She's the one to make sure that robots are being treated properly there. So there's like this great moment where this person's like, Jocasta, I need you to download this thing right now. And then she goes, did you follow the proper ethic? Uh, did you follow the proper ethical protocols? And then he just goes, please? And she goes, you're welcome. And I'm like, yeah, that's really cute. I enjoy that. That's actually really, really fun. Uh, so yeah, he has all that stuff going on. Fing Fing Foom is there, talking cats. There's Tony Stark holograms everywhere. And this entire issue is just this guy going, what, what's this thing? Wait, I, I just made tiny robots. I, why am I here? This thing is happening with this thing over here. And the entire point of this issue was basically just to be your introduction to the world of Tony Stark. Like this guy was meant to be the avatar for the audience as he just gets thrown headfirst into the world of Tony Stark. And that's the thing about this issue. It is an amazing introduction to Tony Stark. If you have never read an Iron Man issue before, this is a perfect first issue. That is an excellent issue to just hand someone. Back when I was working at the comic book store, I always said there needs to be like one issue out there for new readers when they say, hey, I want to start reading about this character who I can just hand them that book. This would be the perfect issue to do that with for Iron Man. Now, that being said, for the people out there who don't need an introduction to Iron Man, I don't know if this is really a necessary read. Like, the rest of the series could end up being great. This first issue, yeah, you know, it was fine. It was totally fine. Again, that is just speaking on behalf of the people out there who don't really need an introduction to this character. Who don't really need to go, oh, okay, so this is his world, this is what it's like to be Iron Man, this is his philosophy, this is how Tony Stark acts. If you don't really need any of that stuff, it's a fun issue, but there's nothing really that big in here. There's nothing really that important going on in here. I did really enjoy the guy who becomes the new employee, the guy who is meant to be the avatar for the audience, because it was fun seeing him just freak out at all the big amazing things. And there came this great moment in there in which he was like, how is nobody else like just astonished by this? How is no one else freaking out over this? And Jocasta just like, please, try and be more serious here. We're at work now. But then this other guy comes up to him and just goes, Psst, hey man, just between you and me, yeah, we're all freaking out about this. This is all amazing, but, you know, we're on the clock. You gotta tap that down right now in front of the boss. So I actually really dug that. I actually really like that one moment in there. Uh, but again, you know, nothing really that huge going on in here other than it just being an introduction. And here's the thing, Tony Stark has a brand new company and he's got brand new staff working there. There are all these people who you see working at this facility and you see all of them keep coming back up over and over again and at the end Tony Stark makes this speech about how it's like, Iron Man is not the suit, Iron Man is up here but it's also in all of them. Everyone at this company, we're all Iron Man and then you see all those people like stand up and cheer and it's all the same people. It's all the same people who you had seen throughout the issue and I looked at that and went, they're going to return. Those weren't just throwaway background characters. These are going to be regular supporting characters and all of them are new. I kind of wish I had gotten some more info on them. Like if this is supposed to be an introduction issue, it's kind of only an introduction to Tony Stark. I wish we had also gotten an introduction to all the brand new characters that we were supposed to meet. We did get for the main character, the character who's meant to be our avatar, but everybody else in there is like, I kind of like, who's that person over there? That person seems neat over there. Who's this person right here? I kind of will have enjoyed meeting all of these people. But as I said, this is the first thing that he's really written after leaving his tenure run on Spider-Man. And I have many complicated feelings about Dan Slott's run on Spider-Man, but towards the end of his run, Dan Slott's Spider-Man became something very weird in which Spider-Man ended up owning the biggest technological company on Earth and he ended up having all these Spider-Man suits and he ended up having like a Spider-Mobile driving him around. And the big complaint that I had with that and the big complaint that so many people in my store kept expressing about that was this doesn't feel like Spider-Man. It feels like Iron Man. This 100% just feels like an Iron Man book. And I was reading this issue and I just went, this feels exactly like that Spider-Man stuff I just read. Like, beat for freaking beat. Like, even the tone of what Iron Man is doing in here felt the same as the tone of what Spider-Man was doing over there. 
because there's a moment in here in which Iron Man is able to save the day because he plays a big song that gets all the robots to work together. And it made me think of the first time that we really saw Spider-Man after he had been running this company and he had a Spider-Mobile and he had like a dubstep Spider-Man theme song playing out of the car as he was driving it. It's like, yeah, it kind of feels like you're just using the exact same tone and the exact same beats from that Spider-Man run that you did over here on this Iron Man book. And one of the problems I had with your Spider-Man run is that so many times it just didn't feel like Spider-Man to me. And I don't mean like it felt like something different for Spider-Man, like a new chapter in Spider-Man's life. No, it just felt like something completely different. It didn't feel like a next chapter in Spider-Man's life. It felt like something out of a completely different book. Now you're on a completely different book. And here's the thing. It actually kind of works on this. And it wasn't just there at the end, because before Spider-Man ended up running his own company, he was working for another company that was a big science company. It was the big brains all coming together in their own special labs over at Horizon Labs. And yeah, first thing that he did when Peter joined Horizon Labs is he went around and introduced him to all these other big scientists working there. And then I was looking at this book where, as I said, at the end of it, I realized, oh, everybody who we've been seeing throughout this book is going to be a regular recurring character. They're all going to have names, they're all going to have a personality, we're going to get to know each of them. Kind of like we did with all those people we got introduced to over at Horizon Labs. This really is just the same stuff he was doing on Spider-Man over on Iron Man. And Dan Slott is a massive Spider-Man fan. He never wanted to leave that book. He wanted to write that book forever. And reading this Iron Man run, I mean reading this first issue on Iron Man, and seeing how well the exact ideas he had on Spider-Man fit in the Iron Man book, it makes me wonder, did you really want to write Spider-Man for all those years? Or did you want to write Iron Man all these years? Because these are just the exact same ideas from your Spider-Man run except they work over here. There's even a mind-controlling villain that gets revealed at the end of this. And for anybody who doesn't know Dan Slott's Spider-Man run, that was kind of something that went on for about a year and a half over there. So yeah, it's just so weird how these are the exact ideas from his Spider-Man run, all crammed into one issue, but they work so much better in this issue. But okay, speaking of Dan Slott and his run on Spider-Man, it's time that we got into Captain America. What, I know how YouTube works. You're all waiting to hear my thoughts on Spider-Man. The moment I talk about that book, you're going to turn this video off. So yeah, I'm going to make you wait on that one. <laughs> um, sorry. So yeah, Captain America. It's now being written by Tony Heasy Coach, the guy who's been writing Black Panther for the past, what is it, two years now? And he's been doing a great job over on Black Panther. So, yeah, I was really interested to see what he would do on Captain America, especially because ta Coates Coates is a very political figure. He is somebody who's been writing for the Republic for a long time, and he is a very outspoken figure in the world of politics. And yeah, if there is one book that you should have a guy like that on, it's Captain America. I know so many people out there have been campaigning recently like, well, we hate politics in Congress. We don't want to see politics in Congress. And like, listen, man, I understand wanting to have just pure escapism, but Captain America has been one of the most political comics since it started back in the 40s. Everybody points back to that first issue where he's punching Hitler. It's like, well, that's a political statement right there. It's like, Captain America never stopped being political. Captain America has always been one of the most political titles out there. And if you've been paying attention to the state of the world right now, we kind of need a Captain America who isn't afraid to talk about some really heavy stuff. And that's the best word that I can use to describe this first issue. It's heavy. I know that after Nick Spencer left Captain America, Mark Wade came on, and a lot of people weren't really happy with Nick Spencer's Captain America run, and they kind of needed a break from that, so Mark Wade came in here, and he basically had a very light and fun Captain America run. It was a very classic style Captain America run, where it was just, I'm going to go and punch these villains. As I said, it was still making political statements in there, but it was a lot lighter. However, I don't really want Captain America to be light. I want it to be heavy. I want to uh, deal with some really big issues. I want it to be really tense. I want it to be really dramatic. I mean, just think about some of the biggest Captain America runs we've had over the past couple of years, like Brubaker's. That was a heavy, heavy run on that book. And yeah, this very first issue, I was like, this is not light, fluffy, happy Captain America times. This book feels like it's got some weight to it. I read this issue and I was like, I just had a meal and I am stuffed right now. 
but in a month, I can't wait to eat this meal again. Yeah, this is one of the best Captain America issues I have read in a while. And as I said, Nick Spencer, he came in here and he tried to get really political with the Captain America book. And I could look at what he was trying to say and I was like, okay, there is a great story in there, but your execution isn't all that great. And a lot of that to me had to do with the odd tones of the Nick Spencer run. Because Nick Spencer is a very comedy heavy guy. He is a super comedic writer, and he came in there trying to tell a really big, heavy story, but then he would just put really weird jokes everywhere in that run, and yeah, it just never created something that felt like what he wanted to accomplish. The tone of it never matched the story that he had in mind. Here, it's a heavy tone with a heavy story. Everything is on the right level. Um, and the other thing that I find really interesting about ta Coates' first issue on this is that Mark Wade came in here and was like, oh man, there's so many things that Mark Wade has to deal with in the fallout of Secret Empire. He didn't mention any of that. Like, he briefly mentioned what happened in Secret Empire in like one panel just in passing. He was like, yeah, nobody, nobody wants to talk about all that stuff. Just, just ignore that. ta Coates is coming in here and like, yeah, no, don't turn away from the horrible crap that happened to this character. No, no, no. We have to address that. And I love seeing the way that he's addressing it, not just with Captain America, but also with the world in general, because yeah, Hydra took over the United States in Secret Empire. That doesn't just get swept under the rug, and he's talking about things like, yeah, America kind of just openly accepted Hydra coming in there and being in control of them. And there's a moment where he's watching the news and he sees like the news is going, the White House today applied Baron Von Strucker for helping to take down a rogue Hydra cell. And like, yeah man, all these Hydra agents, they were in charge of America. Not all of them would go to jail. A couple of them would be able to worm their way out of that and be like, well, I actually had America's best interest in mind. Now, yes, if you want to continue working with me, it's like, yeah, that's kind of what would happen. And yeah, he addressed that in here. Uh, also, he didn't just address the Nick Spencer run, he addressed the Rick Remender run. Like, Sharon Carter went into an alternate dimension in the Rick Remender run, and she was there for decades. So when she came back, she was a much older person, and she's talking about how uh, she feels like she's a person out of time now. Nick Spencer came in here and never really addressed any of that, and Mark Waite never addressed any of that. Ta-Nehisi Coates is actually addressing that. It's like, yeah, that is a huge thing that happened to that character. Someone needs to talk about that. But as I said, Captain America had a guy wearing his face going up there as the new face of Hydra. There's a moment where he goes out there to try and rescue someone and that person he rescues is just like, oh, uh, yeah, um, hey, Cap. Like, they're nervous to be around this guy. And he talks about, yeah, I have to kind of go out there and fix that. He's addressing all the dangling threads from Secret Empire and he's doing it with the appropriate tone. He is giving this story the weight that it should carry. And yeah, he's introducing characters in here like Celine, and I can't wait to see what he ends up doing with her. And also, Lionel Francis Yu, I'm always, I don't want to say hot and cold on Lionel Francis Yu, I'm either hot or lukewarm on him, because I've never disliked his art. But there's a lot of times that he's drawn stuff and be like, yeah, it's, it's okay, it's alright, that's, that's pretty good looking, but then there's other times he'll draw stuff that blows me away. I was blown away by his art in this issue. The art in Captain America number one was stunning. This is hands down my favorite issue of Captain America that I have read in a long time. I am fully on board with where this run is gonna go. Next up, let's go into X-23. Now, if you've been watching this channel for a long time, then you know my feelings on Laura Kinney going back to being X-23. I liked her as Wolverine. But I understand that name is very closely tied to Logan. Logan is back, so all right, fine, whatever. You're giving Wolverine back to him. Fine. What's the new code name for Laura Kinney going to be? Oh, she's going back to X-23. She's going back to the name that she had as an assassin, as somebody who was just working as a doll for this evil corporation, just working for this shadowy government agency as a ruthless killer, having no personality to her, just being a tool, just being a weapon. She hated that name. They had a big moment in Tom Taylor's run on that book where she said that she wasn't going to be X-23 anymore because that was the name of the people who were basically using her and abusing her. She would never go back to that. Now she's back to being X-23. I get that you don't want her to be Wolverine anymore. Fine, 
But X-23A is just a dumb name. It's just a bad name. Code name? Fine. Code name for going out there on secret missions? Great. Works wonderful. Superhero name going out there to stop bad guys? It's just a letter and two random numbers. It means nothing. It is a horrible name to give a character. In fact, for many years, they actually planned on her using the name Feral, just actually changing her name completely. It's like, I don't really like the name Feral either, but at least that's a name. At least that is an actual name for a superhero. Again, I wish it was something else. I don't really like that name, but it's better than X-23. Yeah, man, changing her back to X-23, it just sounds bad. But also, as I said, it's the name of the people that used her as a weapon. Why would she go back to that? That makes zero freaking sense to me, especially after she had this big moment where she said she would never go back to being X-23 because of what that name meant. But she's back to X-23 now because, hey, nostalgia, everybody. Then again, I just talked about how happy I was to see Jocasta back because of nostalgia, so hey, what can I say? But yeah, I was excited about this new run and kind of hesitant about it because Tom Taylor did an amazing run on the Lord King Wolverine book. He introduced her younger sister of Gabby. I absolutely love the dynamics that those two had together. And this is the first time someone has really written that other than Tom Taylor. And I'm like, oh shoot, first time someone new is attempting this. Are they going to be able to carry it on? Is it going to be all the stuff that I still enjoyed? But they handed it over to Marco Tamaki and she wrote this one summer which is an amazing story about just finding yourself about growing up and yeah those are some big themes when it comes to laura kinney and especially a laura kinney with a younger sister she has to take care of so it's like okay if anybody can do it it's going to be her this first issue is amazing i love this first issue it's honestly on the same level as some of my favorite tom taylor issues of the laura kinney wolverine run yeah, this absolutely gives me hope for the rest of this series. It's everything that I was hoping it would be, by which I mean they captured the most important part of a Laura Kinney book. The relationship between her and Gabby. As I said, Tom Taylor came in here, created this great new character, and the dynamics between her and Laura were one of the driving forces behind that book. So if you're going to create a brand new Laura Kinney title, you have to make sure that you continue on with that driving force. They're doing that. I loved Gabby in this issue, and the relationship between Laura and her was great. All of Laura's internal dialogue uh, really captured her personality, where she was. It's bringing up a very interesting thing for a clone to have to think about, because she knows her actual birthday, so she knows that's coming up soon. So that's actually causing her to actually think about a lot of issues, especially because they bring the Stepford Cuckoos in here, who were all clones of Emma Frost, and they're talking about their birthday in there as well, so it's actually causing her to actually think, all right, so I guess some clones are different than me. And Gabby's like, all right, well, I kind of want a birthday too. And Laura's like, it's not freaking important. It's just a freaking number. It doesn't actually matter for anything. We're not real people. She doesn't actually say that part, but you can tell from her internal dialogue, that's the kind of stuff going through her mind. She actually has to kind of fight with this idea of, am I real or not? They never actually have to spell that out though. You're able to pick up on it. That's the brilliant thing about how they write her internal dialogue. They're not beating you in the head with this dialogue. You're able to pick up on what they're trying to say without them having to actually say it. But I'm not going to spoil who the big villain at the end of this is, but it's a brand new villain for Laura Kinney, but it's not a brand new character. It's a character or characters who we have seen for a while now in the comics, and now they're going to become the villain of this first big story arc over in the new F-23 book. And I looked at it and I just went, that is actually a perfect villain for Laura Kinney. Like when you think about who Laura Kinney is and who these characters are, yeah, it kind of feels like eventually they would come to blows and you can understand these villains. Like you see why they're about to do the evil things that they're about to do and you absolutely understand why they're doing it and you understand why Laura Kinney is going to have to stop them. This book was an amazing introduction to the character. It continued all the stuff that I was loving from the Tom Taylor run. It set up a brand new villain for this character while giving that character some solid motivation that made you understand where they were coming from. And the artwork was gorgeous. The artwork actually kind of reminded me of when Frank Quitely was drawing the new X-Men stuff with Grant Morrison, except I never really dug how lumpy Frank quietly made those characters look, which I understand that's his style. I understand that's one of the things that people love about his style. Just aesthetically, it was never my thing. It was just never something that I really enjoyed that much. This reminded me of his art if it was smoothed out a little bit. 
So it's kind of like the stuff that I did like about Frank Quietly, but just that one thing about his style that I didn't enjoy. So yeah, I freaking loved everything about this issue. This was a huge pleasant surprise. All right, next up is Life of Captain Marvel. Now, this is kind of a rough one for me because I love the character of Carol Danvers. I love her as Captain Marvel. The Kelly Sue DeConk run on that character was fantastic, and after Kelly Sue DeConk left, they made her the head of Alpha Flight, they brought on a new creative team, the first storyline for that was fantastic, I really was digging it, I went, this is it, they have set this character up to be the big A-class hero that she deserves to be, and then Civil War II came in, and just did one of the biggest character assassinations I have ever seen in comic book history. And it turned so many comic book readers against her. And after that storyline was over with, they needed someone to come in here and just get everybody charged up again. Just get people excited for Captain Marvel again. And they haven't really. Uh, the writer on that book has been Marguerite Stoll for the past two years. And yeah, it just has not been a really interesting book. Nothing in it has really been exciting. None of the dialogue has really been memorable. It's, man, I hate, I hate bad mouthing books. I really do. I've just found it to be kind of a dull, uninteresting title. And after what they did to her in Civil War II and how it got so many people mad at her, that is the last thing that you need. And I went into this book and I was like, all right, it's still the same writer. However, this is a more personal story for Carol. This is just the story of her origin, not the origin of her gaining her powers, but the origin of her just as a person, of her growing up in Boston and her family vacations in Maine and the relationship that she has with her family. And yeah, okay, that's, that's something new, that's something interesting. And also the writer for this book, I've been saying that the big superhero-y stuff is the stuff that I'm like, yeah, I don't know if this writer can really handle that stuff, but this writer was a young adult author before this, and a lot of young adult uh, books have to do with growing up, and this is going to be the story of Carol Danvers growing up, so I was like, okay, okay, this could actually be the thing that this writer was meant to do. This could actually be like a slam dunk for this writer. It could be great. And I went into this book, and... Almost immediately, I kind of had a sour taste in my mouth because it starts off with Carol talking about her family vacations up in Maine, and it looks gorgeous because you've got Margaret Savage doing the uh, flashback stories, and she is an incredibly talented artist. She's one of my favorites in the industry, and all that stuff looked great. And then whenever it cuts to the present, it's Carlos Pacheco drawing it, and he's great as well. You've got two amazing artists on here, and both of them are just at the top of their game on this book. I thought this was a gorgeous looking issue. But in the flashback, she starts seeing her father beat her brothers. And this issue is kind of all about how her father was abusive, how he was an alcoholic. And it's like, okay, wow, really big, deep personal story. But then when you cut back like to the present, you see Captain Marvel just charging in and just slamming into these villains, just punching them, and actually like saying the words that she said as a kid when she was like witnessing all this horrible stuff happening and all of her rage just coming out. And I didn't, I thought that was, you know, you know how just a second ago I was talking about how in the X-23 book they didn't have to spell out what Laura Kane was thinking, but you the reader were able to pick up on it? It's kind of the same thing with his, except the opposite. In this, I'm like, I understand what she's thinking, we just saw the flashback and we see how it's affecting her here, but having her like actually like lose control to the point where she doesn't even know where she is and she's actually just saying the things that she said as a child, yeah, that's overkill. Like, we understood this. We understood what she was feeling. I don't think the execution on that was the best. Uh, I don't like saying that, but yeah, I don't think that they really handled this idea of Carol having anger issues all that well. Uh, and the rest of this issue is just Carol going back home. It's her seeing her brother. Her brother gets into a car accident and he actually suffers some brain damage. And it's basically just her for nine months just staying at home, trying to help take care of her brother and her mother now that the two of them are in this new delicate situation. And yeah, that is a very heartfelt personal story. Uh, but I really do kind of feel like the writing in here 
it's never really, it's a little bit over the top. I feel like that's the best way to describe it. Uh, for example, there's a moment where she goes to her father's grave and she's just yelling at the father's grave and she like even punches the tombstone. I was like, okay, you want to have her like get angry at her father for the things that her father did. That's great. But again, like punches the tombstone. He went that one step too far in which it's just like, yeah, I don't, I don't know about this. She does just kind of feel too exaggerated with these anger issues. And my other problem with this issue is that I think that this is a good story to tell. But I don't think this was the right time to tell it. Because we're just coming off the heels of Infinity War, and people are still really excited about that ending. People are still talking about, oh my goodness, they teased Captain Marvel at the end of that. And Marvel is coming in here like, yeah, Captain Marvel, she's the one who's going to come in here and help save the day. She's the one who's going to lead the charge against Thanos. She's going to be a really big deal. So I know there are a lot of people who have never read Captain Marvel, who are really excited to start reading about Captain Marvel, and... They're going to go to their comic book store with this number one coming out and the first thing they're going to see is like this story about her dealing with an abusive father and her having anger issues and like again it's a good story to tell it's a really good story to tell but i don't know if this was the exact right time to tell that i feel like after what we got in infinity war with that teaser and with how much marvel is hyping this character up you really do need to just give us a Captain Marvel book where it's her just punching big supervillains, saving the world, just giving insp inspirational speeches to kids, doing that kind of stuff. I feel like, you know, give us a couple issues like that, then, you know, maybe like two years down the line, you give us that storyline, something like that. Uh, but at the same time, I will say this. This is a five-issue miniseries. It's not an ongoing series, which means this thing will wrap up just in time for them to launch a brand new number one for an ongoing series right when the Captain Marvel movie comes out, this was really good timing on Marvel's part. This was really smart that they did not come in here and give us a brand new Captain Marvel series that would just get relaunched in five, six months when the actual movie itself comes out so that they can put out a brand new number one for that. This was the smart way to go about this. So putting out a mini series right now, really freaking smart. I just don't know if this was the subject matter to put out at this time considering what people who just came out of Infinity War want to read in a Captain Marvel book at the moment. Uh, maybe that you should have put out there like two Captain Marvel miniseries. This one that's the personal story and then another one that's just her being a big old superhero. I don't know. It's yeah so I don't really feel like this was the right Captain Marvel story to tell at this particular moment. Also as I said considering the fact that there are still so many people out there who just read comics who are still just really mad at her for Civil War II. She hasn't really redeemed herself yet in their eyes and her getting this storyline that's dealing with her anger issues. I don't really know, again, if that was the best timing on this one. But I will say this. All the family stuff in here, I actually really enjoyed. There are moments in here where it goes a bit over the top, as I said, but this is a really personal touching story and it's good for heroes to get really touching personal stories. So even though I don't know if this was the appropriate time to tell this story, it is a good story for Captain Marvel's backstory. Also, as I've been saying, I don't really know if this writer can really capture all of the high flying space adventure stuff that you need for Captain Marvel. None of that is really in this issue. This issue is just the down to earth personal stuff and that's the stuff that she actually can capture. So it's definitely probably the best thing I've read from the Marguerite Stoll run on Captain Marvel, but I still do have lots of problems with it. However, that being said, those were just my personal feelings, and I don't like to live in a vacuum where I think that my opinions are what everyone else has, where I think everybody else feels the exact same way that I do about these issues. So I always like to go on Comic Book Roundup and see what all the other comic book critics out there have to say, and yes, it's still Wednesday, it's still early, so there aren't many reviews out there just yet. There's only like six reviews for this book up there on the site so far. But it's got like a nine so far. This thing is getting huge praise. This thing at the moment has the highest score of any of the Captain Marvel books that Marguerite Stoll has done. So yeah, even though I have problems with it, even though I'm kind of like right in the middle, I'm giving it like maybe like a six, like I'm like, all right, it's... The family stuff is good, but it's still kind of over the top, and I don't really know how I feel about these other things in there. Even though I have problems with this book, 
Other people out there are loving it. Other people do not have the hangups that I do on this and they are thoroughly enjoying this. And you know what? I bet a lot of those people giving this high scores are people who are kind of new to this run, people who are jumping into this, which is the entire point of this miniseries. This miniseries is supposed to be the personal backstory to this character for a new audience, for people out there who are curious, who, as I said, are just coming off of all the hype that she's gained from the movies right now, and they want to learn more about this character. So to those people, it feels like it's working. It looks like they're enjoying it. So, hey man, even though I have my problems, if it's appealing to the audience it's supposed, it's supposed to appeal to, great. Awesome. No problems there. If it makes someone else out there happy, I'm fine with it. Also, one other thing that I did really enjoy about this issue. Yeah, you kind of need to repair the damage between Carol and Tony. And in this issue, they're friends again. And they are actually coming together and they are actually helping to support one another. Carol has a lot of problems with her family. And Tony's coming in here and is like, uh, did I ever tell you about my dad? Uh, yeah, we're in the same club right here. So yeah, they're actually getting along incredibly well bonding over their really messed up past. In fact, there's something else that they bring up in here that I haven't seen any other writer bring up, which is the fact that Carol is a recovering alcoholic. No one ever mentions that, but I always look at that like, shouldn't that be a big part of her life? Kind of like how it's a big part of Tony's life? Shouldn't that be a thing that also gets brought up every now and again with her? And they actually do bring that up in here. So yes, as I said, the personal stuff, the human relation stuff, the connecting with other people stuff in here, that stuff works. And that is supposed to be the main focus of this book. So even if I do have my problems, there are certainly things in here that I can applaud and I can certainly look at and go, this is why so many other people are really digging this issue. But okay, let's finally go ahead and get into it. The last book that we're talking about and the book that I know that so many of you were waiting to hear my opinions on because you know that Spider-Man is my favorite hero out there, but you also know I wasn't really the biggest fan of the Dan Slott run on that book. It had its moments in there, but yeah, I just didn't really care for his interpretation of Peter Parker. I didn't really care for the overall storyline that he kept following throughout that. So yeah, in the end, I just didn't really enjoy the Dan Slott run on that book. And 10 years is a long time to not enjoy your favorite hero's title. So we finally got someone new on there, and it's Nick Spencer. And I know that a lot of people have negative feelings towards Nick Spencer mostly because of his run on Captain America, but I actually thought that he was going to be a great fit for Spider-Man because before this, he also wrote an Ant-Man series. And Ant-Man is another everyday, average Joe style hero who is constantly down on his luck. That's kind of what Spider-Man is. He's an everyday, average Joe character, always down on his luck. But before all of that, he wrote a book called Superior Foes of Spider-Man. And that is one of my favorite Spider-Man titles of all time. I love Superior Foes of Spider-Man. If you have never read it, you are missing out on one of the best comedy series that has ever come out from Marvel. It is a story of Spider-Man's D-list villains all coming together to create a brand new Sinister Six, even though there's only five of them, and it is just a look at the Marvel Universe through the eyes of loser street-level villains. Like, it's just how do they feel about Spider-Man? How do they feel about the Punisher? How do they feel about the Kingpin? How do they feel about all these other villains out there? How do they feel about Doctor Doom? Like, how do they fit into this tiny, messed up world? I love that unique look at the Marvel Universe, and the jokes in there had me laughing out loud. They were hysterical on almost every single page. So, yeah, okay, this is a guy who understands Spider-Man's rogues gallery. He understands everyday average Joe heroes. How is he going to write Spider-Man? Pretty darn well. I actually really enjoy this issue. First thing I'll say is that before I get into how Spencer wrote Spider-Man, Ryan Otley, amazing artist. Amazing artist. He did Invincible for years and I've been waiting for that guy to come on board to one of the big superhero books like Spider-Man. And yeah, he came on board to the exact book I was waiting for him to come on board to. And he is doing a wonderful job on there. Someone on Twitter, after I said I really enjoyed the book, said, Oh, the artwork is so terrible. And I was just like, well, we're clearly never going to see eye to eye. Like, if you can look at Ryan Otley's art on the Spider-Man book and say it looks terrible, there is literally nothing I will ever be able to say to you to convince you otherwise. It's stunning. I really enjoyed 
the way that he was able to just capture the action, just the tone of this book. Uh, his unique art style just played so well into a character like Spider-Man. So yeah, I absolutely dug uh, the artwork in this issue. But going into how Nick Spencer actually wrote Spider-Man and what he actually set up for Spider-Man, he automatically kind of won me over on page one because the first page of this was a flashback to a sensational Spider-Man annual that happened right after uh, Civil War, when Spider-Man went back to wearing the black suit. And it was just a one-shot that talked about the relationship that Spider-Man and Mary Jane have had with each other. And it's honestly one of the most romantic single issues I have ever read of any comic out there. So the fact that he opened up with that made me go, this is the guy who knows the high points of Spider-Man's life. This is a guy who knows Spider-Man's life and I cannot wait to see what else he's going to bring up from Spider-Man's past. But I kind of thought that all the Mary Jane stuff was going to end there. That maybe we're just going to get another like couple of years of will they, won't they, back and forth. Because there's a moment where they have lunch together and he does kind of have that look on his face of like, oh yeah, I kind of, oh, but we can never be together. Okay. Oh, I get it. It just, it won't happen. Um, but the rest of this issue was basically just Spider-Man's life going to crap. One of the things that's happening to him is that he has a brand new roommate, and his brand new roommate is Boomerang, who was the star of the Superior Foes of Spider-Man book. So automatically, as a fan of that series, glad to see him back, and I'm glad to see that he's still being a total a-hole. But he actually became his roommate in the free comic book day issue that came out. And I looked at that and I went, is Spider-Man not going to know that that's Boomerang? Is that never really going to come up? In this issue, Boomerang is waking him up early in the morning because he's playing Call of Duty Lotvaria, which that's the style of humor that Nick Spencer has. And if you don't find that funny, then you don't find that funny. I find that funny. So he's playing Call of Duty Lotvaria at like 3 o'clock in the morning, waking Peter Parker up. And Peter Parker comes out and comes out to the living room and he just goes, I want to get this guy kicked out. And I could because he's Boomerang. I know he's Boomerang. However, Boomerang stole something from the Kingpin, something very valuable and something very dangerous, but I don't know what he did with it. I don't know where it's hiding. So in order for me to try and learn where it's at, I just have to stick close to this idiot until I can figure it out. And I just went, that's actually a smart thing for Peter Parker to do. And it's actually an appropriate reason for why Boomerang would be his roommate. I'm actually enjoying that. Also, just speaking as a fan of Spider-Man's long history and his long continuity, I like that his other roommate is Randy Robertson, and they actually bring up that they were roommates at one point in time in the past. I always enjoy it when you reference little stuff like that. But also, I'm glad that Spider-Man has friends. Like, I'm glad that he actually says, yeah, Randy's one of my closest friends, and I enjoy that because for years, Peter Parker's friends were Harry Osborn, Mary Jane, Flash Thompson, whenever he came into town, that was kind of it, and I just looked at that and I was like, yeah, Harry was dead for a while, Flash is always off doing his own thing, him and Mary Jane aren't together anymore. Doesn't this dude just have a friend? Doesn't this dude just have a pal he can hang out with? So yes, they looked back and went, who is his friend? Who is his supporting cast other than just these three people over and over again? They brought someone back who would actually make sense to be his friend. So I'm glad that Peter just has a friend again. I'm just happy about that. But his life is also falling apart at work because at the end of the damn slot run, Peter Parker ended up losing that entire big company that he owned and he had to go back to working at the Daily Bugle. But he ended up working at the Daily Bugle as the head of their science department. So it's like, all right, you still got a little bit of a promotion there. You still got something. You're not at the exact same spot that you were at at the very beginning of your run. So, okay, that's fine. In 10 years, you move from there to there. Okay, that makes sense. But this storyline has Peter going to his old college where they have this brand new technology that can tell if you ended up plagiarizing another author's work. And they look at Peter Parker's uh, paper that he wrote to get his doctorate. And they found, yeah, you plagiarize Otto Octavius. You stole this from a paper that Dr. Octopus did. And there's a reason for that. Dr. Octopus was the one who wrote it because Peter Parker got his doctorate when Dr. Octopus had taken over Peter Parker's body and was basically just living his life. And Dr. Octopus was like, I can't be in the body of someone who's not a doctor. I'm going to go back to school and get my doctorate. And that always drove me nuts. That just kind of, uh, that was one of those things about the Dan Slot run 
that just really irked me the wrong way. That now, Peter Parker, he's a doctor! But he didn't actually earn that. No, for the rest of his life, people will be able to call him Dr. Peter Parker. But he never actually got his doctorate. It was someone else who got the doctorate for him. That made me go insane that that never got addressed. And the first thing that Nick Spencer does is he addresses it. And that was one of my problems with the damn slot run is that Peter Parker is all about responsibility and for a guy who's all about responsibility, Dan Slott really wrote him irresponsibly. He really wrote a character who was just like, oh, this thing happened? All right, cool, guess I'll just roll with that. And I was like, no, Peter Parker, if he found out that he had a doctorate that he didn't earn, he's the kind of guy who would go back and turn that in. And then in this storyline, he ends up getting that doctorate taken away from him because he plagiarized from Otto Octavius and Peter Parker goes, the only person I have to blame is myself. I really should have addressed this. I should not have been going around there being Dr. Peter Parker when I didn't earn that. I really should have done something about that. And I was like, oh my God, he's taking responsibility for that. He is addressing the fact that yes, he should have done something about that. He's addressing the exact problem that I had with that. But because it has now made national news that hey, the guy who just six months ago was running one of the world's biggest companies actually was not a real doctor because he plagiarized that work. It's now all over the news, so he loses his job at the Bugle, and even his Aunt May looks at him like, I always trusted you would do the right thing, but this? And you don't even tell me? I had to find out about it on the news? You plagiarized? Like, even Aunt May kind of turns her back on him, and yeah, man, you want to talk about something that is just the final straw breaking the camel's back for Peter Parker. Aunt May turning her back on him. Yeah, that is going to hurt Peter more than anything that the Green Goblin or Venom could do to him. Maybe not the Green Goblin, I just remember that one specific thing that he did. Uh, yeah, but that is going to really hurt Peter Parker. So, yeah, it was one of these things where you just look at that and go, Wow, man, Peter's life has been torn apart, but it's kind of been torn apart because of a thing that he really should have addressed. He kind of did have this coming. Again, I'm one of those guys who hates constantly seeing Peter Parker taken back to zero, but this is the kind of screw up that, yeah, you didn't address that, and because you didn't address that, it kind of has to come up. It kind of has to happen. So I'm actually okay with it this time. But the entire issue ends on something that you guys have been asking me about for weeks now. What this ended on was Peter Parker is talking about how low he is, about how his life has been torn apart and he has to do something special. He has to get everything back on track, and he has to do that with a big flashy display, something that will really wow people. And here's the thing, when Nick Spencer came on board on this title, I just listed for you all the reasons why I said Nick Spencer is a good fit for Spider-Man. But there's one reason that I didn't bring up here, but I did bring it up in that video where they announced Nick Spencer was gonna be on Spider-Man. When they announced that, I came in here and I said, I think he is the perfect fit for Spider-Man. Because Spider-Man, at his current point in his life, he was a guy who had everything. He was running this giant company, but then that company collapsed all around him, and now the entire world hates him for that. Nick Spencer is a guy who finally got the title he wanted to write. He was on Captain America, a book he had been looking forward to his entire life, and he did this big, massive, giant event with it, and it kind of collapsed all around him, and everyone in the comic book community hates him for that right now. And I said there is nobody out there who will be able to understand what Peter Parker is going through better than Nick Spencer. And at the end of this thing, Nick Spencer is talking, I'm sorry, Spider-Man is talking about how everything has collapsed around him, about how it's all turned against him, about how it's his own fault, and in order to try and make things right, he has to start with a big, flashy display. That's not Peter Parker. That was Nick Spencer saying that. Nick Spencer was talking about himself. Nick Spencer was talking about, yeah, this is all the stuff that's happened to me. And you know what? I should have seen that coming. I should have realized this. Like when he was talking about the doctorate and about how, yeah, I should have addressed that. It's like, yeah, man, that's kind of Nick Spencer coming in here and going, yeah, okay, I kind of screwed something up on this, I'll admit. Uh, and saying, I gotta do something to win people back over. That's not Peter Parker. That's Nick Spencer saying, I gotta do something to make people like me again. This thing ends with Peter Parker and Mary Jane getting back together. 
If there is anything out there that could get people to look at a writer and go, oh, you know that stuff that you did before? Water under the bridge. Because you did that thing. Getting Spider-Man and Mary Jane back together is it. Something that an entire generation of comic readers are still pissed about. Something that even after all this time, even new comic book readers are pissed about. There was a poll that Comic Book Resources, or maybe it was News Ramen, it was one of those sites. They held a poll at the 10 year anniversary of One More Day. And they said, yeah, do you still think that that should be undone? And it was huge. It was like 80% of people were like, yes, undo this. Even after all this time, that many people including all these new readers who have come up in the post One More Day world in the last 10 years, still coming in here and going, yeah, that was dumb. That should never have been undone. He came in here and just went, yeah, I gotta do a big flashy display. Bam. How are you like them apples? Yeah, I like them apples. I like them apples a lot. So yeah, I kind of stand by my statement that Nick Spencer was the perfect guy to get on this book because he understands what Peter Parker is going through, and he understands you gotta fix those mistakes you made, man. And he's fixing those mistakes by fixing one of Marvel's biggest mistakes. I hope, I hope, I've had so many people asking me how I feel about this. That is how I feel if it's real. And I have been jerked around by this promise of Spider-Man might get back together with Mary Jane so many times. I can't really take it anymore. So if this is real, awesome. But all that excitement you saw me just have, that's what's going on in the back of my mind. But there's like two bouncers just holding that excitement back. Like, no, no, no. We've been hurt before on this one. Wait and see. I would love to stand up here and just jump up and down and applaud this decision. But I have to actually see them follow this through. And I know a lot of people out there are going, oh, they're definitely going to follow it through because Dan Slott hated Spider-Man Mary Jane. He's said that many times, but he's off the book now. So they're just going to undo that, which I do have to say, I do kind of love that Dan Slott, who wrote this character for 10 years, at the end of his run said, well, I'm going to give him a new job. I'm going to give him all this new stuff. I'm going to set up a new status quo for him. And it's like, dude, you're not writing the book anymore, man. You wrote this for 10 years. You don't get to decide what he is after you leave. So it is kind of funny to me that Nick Spencer, first thing he did on this tile was just go, oh, all that stuff you want me to write? I'm not writing that. I kind of enjoyed that. Um, but yeah, a lot of people have said, well, the reason they haven't gotten back together in the last 10 years is because the guy who's been writing for them the last 10 years doesn't want them back together. So hey, we have someone new writing them. I should not be saying this. I really shouldn't. But I know people who have spoken to Dan Slott privately. And Dan Slott has told them before that he likes Mary Jane and Peter Parker and wants them back together again, but Marvel kept telling him no. And I don't know if that was a lie that they told me. That could totally have been a lie that they told me. It could have been a lie that Dan Slott told them and they then told me. Or it could be reality. Because, yeah, as long as Joe Casada still has some pull over at Marvel, it ain't happening. We ain't seeing that come back. But doesn't it feel like with Marvel Fresh Start, it's them trying to swing so far back to all the old stuff. Doesn't it feel like the one big old thing that everyone has been asking for for a decade? Shouldn't that come back? Old Thor coming back? Old Captain America coming back? Yeah, 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 we got all that stuff. Old Wolverine coming back? Yay, whatever. This is the thing that for 10 years people have been asking for to come back. Doesn't it feel like that should be the number one thing that comes back in Marvel Fresh Start? If you're going to start just bringing tons of old stuff back? <sighs> yeah, I'm really just kind of wondering about this one. If it's real, amazing, wonderful. I'm down, I'm totally in with this, but I don't know if it's real. This could just be them jerking us around again. It could just be them setting up another long storyline and nothing ends up coming from it and they end up breaking it up once again because of all of it. And I don't know if I can sit through that again, man. Uh, you can only really have your heart broken so many times. And I don't know if I'd be okay with them doing it for the third or fourth or fifth or however many times it's happened. So yeah, uh, 
I just, I don't know uh, about this. I would love it if it happens, but I don't know if it actually is. However, the story isn't done there. The story continues because Mysterio goes on trial. There is a backup story all about the trial of Mysterio. And speaking of superior foes of Spider-Man, I love that the new Beatle is his attorney. I love that they're keeping her around. I think she's an amazing character. Uh, so she is his attorney and she is trying to plead that he is insane. And he is staying up there going, I'm not insane, I'm a genius. How come no one sees that? And then all of a sudden, the entire courtroom just turns into hell. Everyone starts rotting and dying and bugs are crawling everywhere. And this demonic figure comes up and says, yeah, man, I can't let you get caught again. I worked so hard to drag your ass out of hell. And now you're just going to go to jail? No, no, no. That wasn't part of our arrangement. And Mysterio is freaking out over this. It's definitely real. It's not a show he's putting on. They definitely just came in here and said, Mysterio got pulled out of hell by some demon. And if you guys know the whole thing about Mary Jane and Spider-Man's marriage, it got erased by Mephisto, the Lord of Hell. So it does feel like they are introducing another element in here that would actually tie into the whole, oh, Spider-Man, Mary Jane marriage thing possibly coming back together. They are introducing something about hell in here. So yeah, it could actually maybe happen. Who knows? But still just talking about this whole Mysterio and he used to be in hell thing, I love this. Because another thing that kind of ticked me off about the Dan Slott run, and I know that this was actually technically before Dan Slott was writing it himself, it was back when he was part of the Big Brain Trust, made up of several other writers all working on. They brought Mysterio back to life, and Mysterio had one of the biggest villain deaths of all time. It was actually a super memorable death. And then after he died, Peter David brought him back, but he brought him back in a storyline where they said, no, 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 he's dead. And this is his ghost basically communicating from hell. And they came in here and had him like address this stuff when no one was around. So it couldn't even have been a show. He wasn't like putting on some big flashy display for Spider-Man. He was by himself. And he was talking about how, yeah, he is just a spirit. He is just a ghost from hell. So like, oh, so the fact that you guys just brought Mysterio back, it not only undoes that big memorable death he had, it also undoes this whole storyline that Peter David had been working on. And yeah, that's kind of cheap. I don't really like that that was just a massive screw you to those other two writers who crafted those stories around this character. Nick Spencer came in here and said, yeah, he is back to life. But they didn't tell you how. All that stuff, the death, him being a ghost in hell, that stuff actually happened as well. Yeah, I'm not throwing out any of that continuity. I'm going to make it all work together. I appreciate that on so many levels. So there you go. Those are my thoughts on all the Marvel Fresh Start books. We covered 13 titles, 14 of you include that very quick blurb that I made about Ant-Man and Wasp. And out of those 14 titles, there were two of them that was like, eh, they're, they're fine. They're, they're okay, I suppose. There's stuff I like, there's stuff I don't like. The other 12 books blew me away, and that is a far better ratio than any relaunch I have ever experienced in my life. And I love that that's it. I love that we're not getting five more Marvel Fresh Start books next month, and then five more the next month after that. We are getting brand new number ones, but that's just because that's how the comic book industry is. Marvel Fresh Start itself, it's these books. Bam, that's it. Enjoy them, follow them along in all their adventures. That's how you freaking do it. It feels so good to have a simple relaunch and have a simple relaunch that just gets me excited for these titles. I've brought this up many times before, but over the past couple of years, I have been getting numb to comics. I'm just not enjoying them as much as I used to. I enjoyed a lot of these books the way that I used to. A lot of these books got me really excited in a way that I have not been excited in a long time to read these titles. So thank you guys for tuning in. Let me know what you thought about all these titles in the comments down below, or you can always contact me on Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr at Professor Thorgy. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Come back next time. Bye.